Well, we're going to begin a new series this morning. We're going to be jumping into a series called Pursuing Spiritual Maturity. And my heart behind this as we jump into this new year, we've been kind of uh, fixing our eyes on how to get a little bit deeper with the Lord. And honestly, for this year, I feel like the Lord is calling us into a deeper place when it comes to pursuing Him. And so my heart is for you guys, and it's even, I mean, it's just across the board for this church, is to see us really start to pursue the more. You understand that there's more to being a Christian than just being here, right? That's not revelation or news to anybody, I don't think. But, but the idea is this, is that there, there's a more about being a Christian. And unfortunately, I believe that for many, we get so comfortable in the status quo that we sort of forget that there's more to this than just coming and listening to a message on a weekly basis or, or maybe just kind of some of the motions that we go through uh, on a regular basis. And, and, and really, honestly, can I just say this? The status quo isn't necessarily bad. There's a lot of stuff that happens in the status quo that's actually supposed to happen, right? But it's when we just kind of get stuck and fixated on those basics and we forget to start pushing and pursuing something deeper that I think that we need to be reminded and we need to be spurred on a little bit to say, there's more. You guys ready for the more? Yeah. Uh, you guys seem like you've been shoveling too much snow this week, so... We have. How many of you felt like you were doing the same thing over and over with that snow this week, right? I don't know how many times we had to clear out the driveway and you think you got it pretty well good and then an hour later you realize it all blew back. So just jump in with me this morning because I really want to encourage you. This, this, this series is meant to be an encouraging series to really get you to question how do I go deeper with the Lord? Because I think it is, it is something that is urgent. It, it's something that the Lord wants in this hour. I believe the disruptions that we've all experienced from church to church in the last year or two have really been there to lay a new foundation to recognize that some of the things that maybe we had been pursuing are not the key things of what it means to follow Christ and to rediscover what some of those key things are so that we can really give our heart to those things and go after God with everything and really enjoy what it means to pursue God wholeheartedly. Because how many of you understand that when we pursue God with everything, there is richness in that. I think, I think sometimes we look at it like eating our Brussels sprouts, but for, for, for those who really pursue the Lord, we recognize that there's such a, a richness and a blessing in going after God with all of our heart. And the question of spiritual maturity comes into play as we begin to look at, well, if there's something deeper, what am I aiming myself at? What am I going after? Because... Really, the, 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 the thing is, we're supposed to be getting refined as we go on this journey, right? We're supposed to be growing. We're supposed to be uh, exploring new territory with the Lord and, and not just being satisfied with the old territory. And so there, there's this question of, of, of maturing in my faith as I go. And so I want to have this conversation over these next few weeks to really look at what maturity is all about. And I want to start off with a passage of scripture this morning in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 11. Now, just bear with me because it sounds a little scoldy, but it's actually it's actually a good verse. This is what it says in 1 Corinthians 13:11. It says, "When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child, and I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. And so there is something in this verse that he's, he's relating our faith and our journey uh, with the Lord. He's relating it to growing up. 
We all understand what it looks like to grow up. We understand that when we were kids, we had a completely different way of looking at the world around us. We didn't have maybe the complexity of thought that we now have, and we couldn't see things the, the way that we do now. Uh, we, we couldn't see that as kids. Uh, how many of you have been around kids enough to know that they see the world a whole lot more innocently than we do, but they also see it a whole lot more simply than we do and so he, he's talking about look when I was a kid I thought like a kid I reasoned like a kid I did things like a kid but then at some point I grew up and I put away the childishness that I once lived under because I matured that's that's his point as I came to a place of maturity and how many of you have been around church enough, uh, long enough, that you've heard conversation about being mature as Christians? And how many of you have even been sometimes perplexed at people talking about maturity in the faith? And how many of you have even seen that maybe used to define things in a way that maybe weren't all that healthy? You know, people sometimes it's like, well, I'm mature, and uh, you know, you still have to mature. Right? I mean, this is sometimes the way that this is talked about. And honestly, there, there's this feeling like somehow that if I mature in Christ, I reach this point where I've arrived. And, and, and the Lord, and then I, I teach this over and over, so I'm hoping that this is sinking in at some point to some of you. But we have to recognize that being a Christian is not about arriving at some location in our faith. As long as you draw breath, you grow closer to the Lord. Or at least that's the idea. And so there's not this place of coming to even maturity. And I think oftentimes what we confuse as maturity is people's knowledge about the Lord. And so the one who comes into church and they can quote the Scriptures and they can, they can talk eloquently about theology and philosophy and worldview and they sound so deep and rich when they talk. And we look at that and we go, well, that's somebody who's mature in the faith. And in the West, we really put a, a priority on knowledge. But I think that we need to get away from that, that concept uh, of just really being mature because we know so much. I think that we need a better definition of what it means to mature in Christ. Because how many of you recognize that you can be the, the kind of person who can give all the right answers, say all the right things in all the right moments, and yet your life is not being lived for Christ? How many of you have been around that person? Like, it's obvious. You, you talk to them, and it's like, man, they, they're really knowledgeable. But then you watch how they live, and you're like, there's something missing here. How many of you have been that person at some point? <laughs> Amen? <laughs> we don't like to admit that, but there's been times in our immaturity that we were puffing our chest out, acting like we were super Christians, and acting like we knew it all. And yet, we really weren't living a life that backed any of that up. And so I think we need to start thinking about spiritual maturity spiritual growth I mean, that's what we're talking about i think we need to have a better definition than just somebody who really comes to the table with a lot of knowledge and information and so i i sat down this week and and just in prayer just said okay lord what's a better definition i don't know if this really is or not but i'm going to give it to you and if you don't like it throw it away and if you like it then do whatever you need to do with it and this is in your notes, so if you're following along in the notes. A better definition of spiritual maturity is this. Spiritual maturity is where our knowledge, our passion, and our practice join together to produce an ever-increasing Christ-likeness in our lives. Does that sound good? Okay, good. So we're on the same page. Because I was I really the rest of this is going to be not good if you didn't buy into that. But, here, but that's the thing. Maturity is this process 
that we go through in the course of our life where we learn how to become more like Christ. And in order to become more like Jesus, we have to take our knowledge that we're acquiring and we have to put it into practice. And we have to raise up, that there has to be some sort of a passion in our hearts for what it is that we're pursuing in the Lord. And when those things come together, they start producing fruit. And that is really what maturity is about. It's about producing fruit in your life. How many of you can say what the fruits of the Spirit are? Someone join with me. I learned this by singing with children when I used to be a, a youth pastor. But it's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and self-control. Would I miss something? Okay. Well, it is in the King James. It is. But, but, but for those of us who read the NIV, that's right, NASV. You threw me off, buddy. <laughs> but we have to get to this place where we recognize that growth is important, but growth for growth's sake is not the end result. Growth, growth to become more like Jesus is what matters. And, and, and the fruit that comes in and through our lives, that gets expressed in and through our lives, is what God is really wanting of us. And there is something about the journey that we're going on as we mature in Christ that allows us to become less like the person we once were and more like the person we need to be. And how many of you recognize you should be able to look back at your life and the journey that you've been on and you should be be able to recognize, hey, I've gotten a lot better than I used to be. You see, but here's the, here's the twist. This is where it all comes down to and where it all matters. It's not just that we can look now and say, I'm better than what I used to be, because how many of you know you can rest on that? It's that we look at the past and we say, I'm better than who I once was, but I want to be even better. I want to become even more like Jesus. And I want to really pursue God with greater passion and desire. And I want to see God doing more in my life. I don't want to just rest on where I've been. I want to take some new mountains. Come on, y'all. You should be way more excited than you are right now. And that's the thing is, is that look, we look forward when it comes to maturity and we start to say, what is the next mountain? How do I grow? What is it that I have to conquer in my life right now? Because how many of you know that just because you've been saved doesn't mean that everything just lines up in your life? Wouldn't that be nice? But that's not how it works. There's still challenge there's growing pains there, there there's things that we have to work through things that have been strongholds in our life that we need to disrupt and we need to do battle for or against i should say but there's stuff on that journey and we have to start looking forward and saying okay well how what is it i need to deal with right now to get me further along down the road so that when i'm down the road i look back and i go i'm better I'm closer. I'm further on this journey because how many of you have ever caught yourself in a season with the Lord where you looked back on you realized all of a sudden, wait, I didn't get better for a while. I may be even worse than I was. You know, someone once told me, I don't know if it's 100% true, but it makes sense. They said, in your journey with the Lord, you're either moving closer or you're moving away. There's no standing still. Because even when you're standing still, the Lord keeps moving. Sounds good, doesn't it? Deep. So here's what I want to spend today on. I want to take a look at what some of the benchmarks that the Bible lays out for our maturity. What, what those benchmarks look like. This was another one of those messages I sat down and I had a... I had two sermons packed into one sermon. 
So I had to cut it down. You'll get the second half next week. But I really just want to take a look at what the Bible says maturity looks like. And I, and I hope that in the process of at least coming up with a better definition today, clarifying what maturity looks like, I'm hoping that that sets you up to begin to ask the right questions. And you may find yourself in one of these areas, and you know all of these areas are a good place to be because it means that you're with the Lord. But you may need to look at where you're at and start to say, okay, well, I want to go to that next place. And then it's up to you with the Lord to begin to wrestle with how do you get there. I would love, you know, this is one of the great mysteries of faith. I would love to be able to say, well, it's very simple. You just do A, B, and C. And there are pastors who write books about A, B, and C. And A, B, and C may work for you. But I've learned over the years that A, B, and C doesn't always work for everybody. And everybody has to wrestle with things with the Lord on their own. And God guides you to your A, B, and C. All right, so jump in with me. So we're on uh, point number two here, which is what are the biblical benchmarks of spiritual maturity? 1 John 2, 12 through 14 says this. I am writing to you, little children... Because your sins are forgiven for His name's sake. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know Him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. And then he goes back. He says, I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know Him who is from the beginning. And I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the Word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. And here's what I want to extract out of that. There are three biblical benchmarks of maturity contained within this passage of Scripture. The first one is this, that we are children. And this is how... He defines children. Their sins are forgiven and they know the Father. Now this is literally the beginning of having a relationship with God. When we enter into God's kingdom, into His family, we enter in through the place of having our sins forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ. And this is good! But, it, but it's this, this thing of just being happy. And, and this is what he's pointing to. Look, he's saying, look, you start out in this place of being a child where your sins are forgiven. But what happens if that's it? What happens if we come to the place where we're just happy that our sins are forgiven and we just sit in that place of being happy that our sins are forgiven? Well, when we're children, that's okay. Because how many of you understand that the things that happen uh, within the right time, that that's natural, that's okay, that works. So in the beginning, it's okay to be happy about being, uh, being forgiven. It's okay to, to recognize, hey, my sins, I don't have to, to, to answer for them anymore. I'm free. There are so many people in the Western church today that that's as far as it ever has gotten. They, they sit and they, they, they just, well, I'm forgiven. Okay, well, there's more. There's something else. Like, that's not the end. That's the beginning. But we've, we've focused the message in the church on not on discipleship. We've focused the message of the church on salvation. And so we constantly seek people to save, and that's a good thing, right? Like, let's not get down on this. That's a good thing. We're looking for people who need Jesus. We're looking for people to save. And as a church, our message should always have some element of salvation. But how many of you recognize that we've just decided that that is the message of the church and then as soon as people come in they go oh i want that i want to be saved they get saved and then we put them in a pew and we say now sit 
and listen. And who knows what you're supposed to be doing? And so we've raised up a generation of people, unfortunately, who feel like they've done what they need to do because they said yes to Jesus. And Jesus is saying, look, that's the beginning point. That's the launching pad. That's where you just come in. And it's good that you're happy about salvation. And he even points to the fact it's good that they know who the Father is. How many of you understand that children know who their parents are? Even from a little age, I was watching uh, the Wagner kids this morning. All 30 of them. (laughs) But there was one moment where two of them came over to TJ and they wanted to be held. They knew who their father was. And listen... This beginning point is a difficult stage. There's a lot wrapped up in it. It's not just that it's so simple and you have to get beyond the simplicity of it. That's not the point here. There's a lot that has to happen for you to even be a child of God. Because you have to recognize where you've been. You have to recognize your sins. You have to recognize your need for a Savior. You have to come to a place of repentance before the Lord. And let me tell you something, that is not easy. That is probably one of the most complicated things you will do as a person, especially if you didn't get raised in a church. If you weren't brought up with God and you come to faith in Jesus, that's huge. You took big steps to get to that place. And so it's not a matter of even simplicity, but it's a matter of saying, okay, now you're in. Let's get to work. The issue I have is not with the new believer who rests in this. Because their understanding of God is not that deep yet. I mean, they know who God is now, And they recognize what God has done in their life. But they don't have a depth of knowing the Lord. And they don't understand the journey yet. So my issue is not with people who first come to Jesus. And it doesn't matter. You can be a child that's actually a child. You can be a child of God who literally is 80 years old. Because it has more to do with when you get into a relationship with the Lord than it does with age. But what I have an issue with is people who were saved 30 years ago and they're still in the same place. And when you, re- when you talk to them, they're just happy because they're saved. And they walk around so blindly. And I don't want that for anybody. What I want, my, the desperate cry of my heart as a pastor is to see people raised up so that they might mature. And they might move beyond just the simple wrestling, and it's not even simple, but the basic wrestling with their sin. I mean, you see this all the time. There are people who say, I'm a Christian. And yet, their whole life is lived like the world. And you go, what happened? Well, what happened was, they said yes. And that's it. And instead of having victory or anything else, They're just wandering in the place of, I said yes. Well, how great of a relationship is that? The answer is it's not, so in case you were asleep. What if your married relationship was just still in the place of, well, I said yes. Tell me, wives, how happy would that make you? What do you want from me? I said yes 20 years ago. You got all of this. <laughs> Come on, husbands, right? That's all we would answer. <laughs> That's not what they want. They want your heart. They want that richness of depth as you go on the journey and get to know each other. They want that. 
Just because you said yes doesn't mean everything. So let's move on. The second area of maturity that this scripture lays out is young men. And, and, and listen, these are, these are gender specific, I guess, you know, how it was written. But understand, young men, young women. And this is what he says of them. He says that they have overcome the evil one. You have strength. And he says, the Word of God abides in you. And I want to start off at that last phrase, the Word of God abides in you. We talked about the Word of God abiding in us a few weeks back, if you would remember. But the idea here is that it is alive in you. And see, so what you see here is people stepping out from just being happy about knowing God or knowing who God is. And they start to, uh, to read the Word of God. They start to feed on the Word of God. And that Word begins to produce life in them. And it starts to begin cha uh, uh, changing their life. It begins to produce stuff in, from the inside, the spiritual man, to the outward natural man. And so there is this abiding that happens with the Word of God. And this is sort of, I think, that next step is that we start to care. Well, what did God actually say? What does God really want? What is God communicating to us, uh, especially to me, that I should do? And so you begin to, 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 to really digest what God has said, and you begin to apply that into your life. And it starts to produce life. And then two things happen that he mentions here because the Word of God is alive and active in you. The first thing is, is that you uh, uh, overcome the evil one. Do you recognize he's talking about people who are in that young man, young woman phase of their maturity as believers that they've had some victory over the enemy. That areas that they used to be tempted in they no longer are tempted because they, they put that thing to death. That the enemy is no longer has the access into their hearts, their minds, and their lives like he used to because they've shut those doors. They've said no to the devil and they've had victory over him. This is something that doesn't happen when you're a child. You haven't won victories yet. But when you grow up a little bit, you start to win some victories. And you begin to see how your life is different. This is where things begin to shift in your heart and your mind. And you start seeing the world through a different lens because your eyes are beginning to open. And you're beginning to recognize the work of the enemy around you. And you begin to say, no, I'm going to fight against that thing. And the second thing he talks about is that they have strength. How many of you understand that when you have victory that it produces strength when you win you feel like i can do that again right how many of you have played on a sports team and maybe you were having a struggling season i've watched this as, as a coach and i've done this as a player but you, you may be going through a season where it's, you're struggling to get everybody doing what they're supposed to do and then finally somewhere in the middle of the season everything begins to click and you have this great victory where you thought you weren't going to and then all of a sudden there's this air of maybe youthful enthusiasm. Like we could beat everybody. Could you get a taste of victory? And it gives you strength and it gives you courage. And it begins to push, push, and push until you have new ceilings and new capacity in the Lord. And this is where God is bringing us along on that journey and we're maturing past the beginning. We're starting to see what it means to live life as a Christian and what that looks like. The last thing he talks about is fathers. And the only thing, it's really interesting, the only thing that he mentions here about fathers is that they know God. He says like that, you know God who was from the beginning or you know Him who was from the beginning. But he talks about you know God. 
And this is very different knowing God than that child of faith. When you become a father or a mother in Christ, this is coming to the place of knowing God intimately. It's not that you know about Him. You see, in the beginning, when you're a child, you can recognize Him, yes. And you may know about Him. But there's a difference between knowing about Him and actually being intimate and having a depth of relationship with Him. And this is an area like, because this is where God is leading us to, is to a place where we really know God. Because we're walking with Him all the time. We recognize and we see Him in the little things, in the big things, in, in the moments of our day. We recognize when God is showing up and we're able to walk with the Lord. This is a whole different phase. This is even getting before or getting beyond just, well, I've had a few victories, right? This is beyond just, you know, that little bit of advancement of having more strength and confidence in who we are. And this is beginning to shift our focus from what God has been doing to God. Like there is a point in your life as you grow in the Lord where you stop being so obsessed with what God can do for you. And you start to say, I don't care about any of that. I just want to know you, God. I just want to be with you, Lord. And that's the thing. We get to that place where we can experience that. And you know, a lot of people look at us who would be fathers and mothers in our faith and in our journey, and they think we're cracked. Because the conversation changes. It's not just, well, God said, when you're a young person in the faith, You're abiding in the Word, right? So a lot of what you're saying is, well, God said this, and God says that. The conversation shifts when you really get to know God. You start to have a conversation more like this. Here's what God told me. Here's what God has been revealing to me. Let me tell you something. You want to get some crazy looks on people's face? Tell them what God told you lately. But when you know God, that's going to happen. It becomes a part of the process. And you recognize, you see what, your eyes are opened. And you see so much deeper what's happening around you. And it's no longer about you anymore. It's about getting deeper with the Lord, knowing God, and seeing God doing something in and through your life. This is kind of that place where God is pulling us towards. Someone once did a study, I just heard this recently, And in terms of maturity, about 70% of the church is still in the place of being a child. That's scary. God wants to grow us. I want to wrap things up this morning, but I have a hard time doing that. I want to point you to something and we'll just I'm just going to kind of uh, bring this down quickly as quickly as possible which means nothing if you're in your notes what God is pointing you to is the fact that better things await Hebrews 6 1 through 3 says this therefore let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity. I, that could just be all we say. Let us leave behind the elementary doctrines of the faith and go on to maturity. Well, he doesn't leave it there. He says, here's what I'm talking about. He says, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God and of instruction about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel, free, we feel sure of better things. Things that belong to to salvation 
And if you summarize this, and it's on the, I, I had this explained, but I just feel like I need to summarize it this morning. If you summarize this, what Paul is saying to us is very simple. Once you've laid a foundation, the foundation is laid. That sounds very wise. It's kind of like a Yoda statement. But once the foundation's laid, the foundation's laid. At that point, it's time to start building on the foundation. And what he's pointing them to is he's saying, look, you've got to get beyond the things that you keep going back to. These are the simple, this is the, the basic stuff. And while the basic stuff is good, and we should lay that foundation, at some point you have to start going, what else happens? What do we start building on this thing? And that's what he's leading us to. He's saying, look, get past these elementary things and begin to look forward to what it is. That is beyond the elementary. And start chasing after that. Go after that stuff. And it's not that you don't ever return to those things. Because how many of you understand that the foundation is still the foundation? And you still want to have a healthy and strong foundation. But let me tell you something. If you're driving down the road, and there's been a lot of new construction in the last couple of years, right? You'll see houses popping up here and there. If you drive by a house and you go, wow, there's a foundation. You start getting excited. What is this house going to look like? What is this building going to look like? Well, what happens if you drive past that same place five years later and it's still a foundation? You know, that goes back to this passage we were reading last month, right? But you start to look at it and you go, this is, there's, not, there's something wrong about this. Because the foundation is the start. It's not the finish. And actually, if you look at it, while the foundation is super important, it makes up a very small percentage of the entirety of the building. And what I'm asking you this morning to consider is what are the better things ahead of you when you start building what is the more where are you going what is it that you're building your foundation is laid let's start making a beautiful building and let God do something in you greater than you could expect because how many of you understand that it doesn't matter where you've been, who you once were, all the dumb things you ever did in your life, it means nothing. Because you know what is beautiful about doing this with the Lord? Is that He is a master builder. How many of you have ever been around somebody that knows what they're doing? Especially when it comes to construction, you're all laughing because, and don't look at your husbands right now. <laughs> I saw a few elbows flying there from, hur, 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 hur. it's nice being around someone who knows what they're doing. Not like you. But let me ask you this Have you ever been around somebody who really knows what they're doing and you have no clue? But you jump in with them, and because they know, because they understand, you do something that you could never do on your own. And actually, at the end, it builds some confidence in you, because, hey, I did this. And how many of you have then decided to do something then on your own, only to realize it wasn't you? And I say that to be silly, but the point of the matter is, is that Jesus is the master. He knows. When you begin to build with Him on the foundation of your salvation, He knows where to build. He knows how to do it. He gets it done. And it will be way better than if you try to build it on your own. Does that make sense? And there are better things ahead, not because you have anything that qualifies you or because you're good at any of it, because the Lord is building you a house on that foundation. 
And so this is what I want to do as we close. We're just going to say a prayer this morning. And I want to ask you to do something maybe a little bit different than we normally do. And that's this. I want you to just pray into these next few weeks. And I want you to pray a simple yet dangerous prayer and just ask the Lord, God, would you open my eyes? Would you help me to see maybe where I'm at right now? Would you start to give me a taste of where you want to take me? And Lord, would you help me to grow? So we're going to pray into that for a minute. I'm going to ask each and every one of you, just where you're at, pray something like that. Invite the Lord to come and to challenge you. And again, not so that we can say, hey, I grew. There's something bigger that God wants to do. Lord, we, we ask You today. We recognize, every single one of us, that we have not come to this place of full maturity. Lord, we even recognize in Your Word that You tell us that we only see like through a glass dimly, but at some point when we're with You, Lord, that we will see things with perfect clarity. Lord, what that says to me is we all have room for improvement because each one of us has blind spots in our lives. We don't see clearly. But each one of us, Lord, I think in the, 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 the pit of our stomach and our hearts, Lord, that we, we recognize that You've called us to growth and maturity, that there's something beyond just saying yes. And even though that's a good thing, it's not the only thing. So Lord, I just pray over these next few weeks, pray for those that will be here, that will listen. And I ask, Lord, that You would begin to just open up our hearts, that we would begin to recognize there's something, Lord, You're calling us into, and it's good. And so, Lord, we give You permission today over these next few weeks to prick our hearts, Lord, to make us a little bit uncomfortable. Enough so that we might begin to say, okay, here's where I need to change. And so, Lord, we just thank You for what it is that You're going to be doing. I pray, Lord, over those that have come this morning and maybe they're feeling discouraged. Maybe this morning was rough and getting here was hard. Lord, I just pray that You would just minister to our hearts this morning that we might be refreshed and renewed. That we would start this week off not in a place of discouragement but into a place of encouragement where Lord, seeking after these deeper things would not get sidetracked or derailed. And so, Lord, I just thank You for the work that You do in each one of our lives. And we thank You for this morning. We pray, Lord, now that as we go, that we would take You with us. That we would take what we have heard this morning and what we've experienced. And, Lord, that we might shine a light into a dark world. We just pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.